I cannot focus exclusively on how a Hindu is being treated in this country when this is not a country which is exclusively of Hindus, when there are other people also, so automatically I'm bound to ask this question. Not only do I want to know how you're treating me, I want to know whether you're treating me at least at par with others. If it's an exclusively a Hindu country full of only Hindus, then the question of discrimination between religions does not arise. But equality and discrimination become relevant when there are others and you see that they're being treated differently. So assume for a moment, and I've given this example before, that you were a student in a classroom and you realize that the teacher has the power to give corporal punishment, physical punishment to every student. But the teacher is constantly singling you out and slapping you on a regular basis. Your first question will be, why am I being slapped? Your second question will be, why am I the only person being slapped? Both these questions will arise. So at this point, both these questions have arisen in the Hindu mind with respect to the judicial treatment and the state's treatment of Hindus as a community and our institutions. Whenever you speak of state control of temples, your mind immediately says, I need the state for security, I need the state for maintenance, I need the state for crowd management, I need the state to handle administrative issues. And therefore, I'm happy to tolerate the presence of the state in the temple as long as they don't touch my religion, as long as they don't touch my religious affairs. According to me, there can't be a more self-defeating distinction. The institution's management and administration is in the hands of a different entity altogether, which is dying to call itself a secular entity, doesn't want to call itself a Hindu entity. And a fundamentally secular entity is holding the reins of the administration of your religious institutions and you're operating under the naive belief that they will control only secular aspects which won't have an impact on religious aspects. How is that even possible? If the money is in their hands, the ability and the power to appoint people to different positions is in their hands, your security is in their hands, how do you hope to have the freedom only with respect to religious affairs? How is that even possible? Not possible. So to assume that as long as the state gives me the commitment that it will not interfere with religious aspects of an institution, I am happy and therefore my religion is secure, impossible. Because what you believe are the secular aspects, are the ones that give you the power to invest in the society. Money, if it is secular, is the one that gives you the ability to invest in your community. So how can that essential aspect be in the hands of the government? The Jagannath Mandir in Puri is effectively run by 36 mathas. Each of the mathas are in the control of state government bureaucrats. Each of them saying, I don't have money, I don't have money. When the daily ritual of Jagannath Puri as a temple is based on contribution of all the 36 mathas and over the years, every matha has progressively stopped its contribution to the daily ritual. Now, if this is the fate of big temples, then imagine what must be happening with Chik Chik temples. <laughs> So in these big temples, citing lack of resources, which is the secular aspect which you've given to the government, he is saying, I can't give today's prasada, do whatever you want. I don't have the money to renovate. I don't have the money to maintain this library. I don't have the money to digitize this particular manuscript. I don't have the money to ensure that people do not come and do something that they're not supposed to in a temple in terms of security, employing CCTVs and whatnot. So, this belief goes against dharmic principles because dharma and artha go hand in hand in dharmic philosophy. For fulfillment of dharma, you need artha. And therefore, if artha is in the hands of the state, which is the rajya, how on earth do you think you have the freedom to fulfill your dharma? Not possible. So let us break this wall completely, which says, Religious and secular are two different things. No, that is the Christian mentality, that is Christian philosophy, that is not Hindu philosophy. Hindu philosophy effectively says, Dharma and Artha go hand in hand. We realize that you need Lakshmi to run even an institution that is dedicated to Saraswati. We are very clear about that. We don't need to be embarrassed about the fact that you need money to run a religious institution. Hinduism does not celebrate poverty. 
they come from all walks of life all of them may not be equally placed as far as their status is concerned therefore the one place that they come must act as a leveler so that everybody is treated as one here and therefore facilities must be provided where will that money come from so when someone tells you why should a religious institution have so much money please ignore that person as a secular hindu idiot because he doesn't know what he is talking about anyone who tells you that a religious institution must not have money because the moment it has money it is corrupt then thank you let the state not collect taxes because the moment you contribute something by way of tax to the state well it is bound to become corrupt and the state is fundamentally corrupt according to me whether it has money or not doesn't make a difference so therefore first break that wall in your head when you have a matha or a temple why do hindus contribute land to that particular temple or matha what is the logic largely two reasons one that that land acts as a source of revenue for the temple that's one second land translates to real estate translates to hindu presence so that the land which is adjoining a temple or a matha must be owned by people who are followers of the sampradaya of that matha so that they respect the tradition of that matha or temple otherwise you will have slaughter houses open right outside the matha if it happens to be a shakta matha then that's a different issue it can have a slaughter house no problem but even then it must be cut not in the halal fashion but in the hindu fashion which is the jhatka fashion therefore even if it, if it happens to be a shakta tradition i would be happy to give a meat house to someone who happens to be a practitioner of the shakta tradition and to nobody else so if the institution belongs to the subsect then the institution must be run by people who are in that particular subsect why is this point important the supreme court has come out with a verdict saying when you issue tenders for shops surrounding a certain temple apparently non hindus can apply for that particular tender because it is a secular activity what has it got to do with religion you see how this distinction works the moment you separate the secular from the religious in the context of a religious institution you are creating an anomaly because everything about a religious institution is religious 100% why because i am interested in using the resources of my community only for my community is good and nobody else is good i am entitled to make that particular statement i don't need to prove my secular credentials with respect to a religious institution if i can't be religious with respect to a religious institution where will i be religious i don't understand look at the stupidity of this position this is the one place where i'm allowed to wear my religion on my sleeve that should be a position what is so wrong about this in 1954 in the shirur mat judgment please read that judgment because it has huge consequences and that is currently the subject of the sabrimala judgment as well as well as petitions relating to freeing temples from state control now assume for a moment that you are trying to find the meaning of a term that is used in quran will you refer to the oxford dictionary to understand its meaning you will not then why do you want to use the oxford dictionary to understand the meaning of the word sampradaya what is the logic so in that judgment which is treated as the landmark judgment on what is the meaning of a religious denomination not one reference to one hindu commentary on what is the meaning of a sampradaya because the court was trying to understand what is the role of a matha and what is the role of a mathadipati in a matha and the question was whether a matha and its followers constitute a religious denomination within the meaning of article 26 so that they can protect their independence in matters of running the institution as well as religious affairs this was the question that the court was asking during the entire analysis not one whisper on what is the meaning of a matha whether a matha or a sampradaya as understood in dharma is the same as the manner in which a religious denomination is understood in christianity no such question is ever asked why because the constitution is written in english and therefore your go to reference when you don't understand the meaning of a word or if you think it's ambiguous is an english dictionary so understand the close nexus between bhasha and thinking how they influence each other and what kind of outcomes it can lead to so in that judgment here's what the supreme court does it says mathadipati is someone who is meant to be the custodian of that particular institution and therefore 
if an executive officer is appointed by the state to supersede the powers of the Mathadipati and take away his power to run that particular institution, it effectively translates to government takeover of the Matha, which is not permissible. To that extent, the court is right. Now, since that judgment was delivered in the context of a Matha, and this was in the context of the Hindu religious and charitable endowment legislations of then Madras presidency, which included current day Karnataka, certain parts of Andhra Pradesh and current day Tamil Nadu. The Tamil Nadu government said, since that judgment was delivered only in the context of a Matha, according to the Supreme Court, I can't take over a Matha, but I can take over a temple which is not connected to a Matha. So the logic of the state government is, it was a Matha which was the subject of the judgment not a temple which is not connected to a matha and therefore the freedom and independence that is available to a matha is not available to those institutions that are not connected to a matha so today as it stands as the law stands these legislations strike a distinction between temples which are standalone temples and temples which are connected by connected to mathas in the process some have become second grade institutions now ask yourself a simple question if the issue is of autonomy of a religious institution, why should the logic be different between a matha and a temple? What is the logic? If you believe that the state is fundamentally a secular entity under the current constitution, whether it is a matha or a temple which is not connected to a matha should not make a difference to the fact that a secular state has no business being inside that particular institution. That logic is uniformly applicable. That particular logic has not occurred to the Indian state for the last 60 years. So as a consequence, what has happened is, despite the Shirurmat judgment clearly saying that the state does not have the power to take over a religious institution permanently, all it can do is to rectify mismanagement and get out of that particular institution and give it back to the community. For the last 60 years, at least since 1959, despite a Supreme Court judgment, State governments have taken the position that the judgment does not apply to standalone temples. And therefore, you have executive officers who have been appointed across the board with or without reasons in temples across the board in all the southern states, at least in Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, Telangana. The point I'm trying to make is even the Supreme Court's verdict has no value and its position has no value when it comes to the rights of the Hindu community. If the problem statement is that either the institution sometimes does not understand your position or even if it happens to understand your position by some happy coincidence, the state is not willing to listen to the Supreme Court, then what are the options left to the Hindu community? I am posing this question to the community as a practicing lawyer, saying what are the options available to you if even the word of the highest constitutional court of the land has no value in the eyes of state governments? So whenever we speak on this particular subject, we are constantly asked by members of the audience, what can we do as practicing Hindus? What is it that we can do? So I will give a slightly mischievous suggestion. Make sure that any government appointee in a religious institution, especially in a Hindu institution, is pushed to the limits of compliance, which is to say, he must constantly fear questions from the public. It must not be an easy ride for him under any circumstances. I am not asking members of the public to do anything that is illegal. I am merely saying make sure that whatever he does is legal and if, even if he has the slightest of intentions of making a departure, he must fear public reactions in terms of vocal reactions. I don't mean unconstitutional reactions, I am saying vocal reactions. To the extent that anyone who is appointed as an executive officer to any Hindu institution must tell himself this is my punishment posting because I can come and tell you a few things about what the Supreme Court has said and what are the legal differences and nuances and technicalities but I think it's time to arm the public with solutions practical solutions I don't think it makes sense for anyone sitting in some remote part of the country to sit and worry about what will happen to all the money in Tirupati you first worry about the temples in your street and then you think about Tirupati unless and until you're able to make an example out of state appointees in institutions which are in your proximity and in your vicinity, you are in no position to sit and talk about Tirupati. Look at the scale of the problem there. Jewels are gone, gold is lost, Tirupati's money is dipped into 
like state coffers for building of flyovers for building of institutions which have got nothing to do with tirupati that particular temple so it's almost as if the temple is running the city and certain parts of the state so therefore my point is work towards practical workable local solutions the thing that you can do as a practicing hindu is to take an active interest in the running of the affairs of your local temples first focus on them protect them when a temple falls under disuse it becomes public property and it is ripe and open for encroachment and illegal encroachment and when you think of a temple don't limit yourself only to that particular institution think of it as an ecosystem which means when you think of a temple you should immediately ask most temples have lands associated with them what is the status of the land associated with this particular temple and you will find that most of them are under encroachment and illegal occupation in most cases not by members of the community at least if it's members by the of the community then you can still kind of hope to regularize it take some rent but if it's members of some other community secularism will immediately come in the way and you will not be able to take action